Hello, welcome to this video where we look at continuity, but on an interval. What x values would a function be continuous for? In the previous video, we looked at what does it mean for a function to be continuous at a point? Now we want to look at, at a bunch of points. What does it mean for a function to be continuous on an interval? It's what you think. You are continuous at every point that's in that interval. Okay, sounds good. So here's an example. The previous video had this uh, drawing of a graph and we were looking at uh, discontinuities of this function and the categories of them. And if you're able to recover one-sided continuity, and we saw that at a couple of these values, we're able to get right-hand or left-hand continuity. So I've drawn little arrows here. I should have drawn one on the uh, at x equals four from the left, but anyway. So we want to find out then for this particular function, what intervals is the function continuous for? So let's start all the way over at the left. So that arrow means it goes on forever in that direction. So we're going to break this up into pieces. Let's look at the first chunk from minus infinity to minus four. Makes sense. It's continuous there. There's no breaks. Basically, layman's terms, continuity is about whether there's a break in the graph or not. Officially, if you are drawing the graph of this function and you have to lift whatever writing utensil you're using in order to continue drawing, then your function is broken there. Your function is discontinuous, basically. All right, so I'm drawing the graph of this function. Something's going on at negative four. I have to stop writing. Okay, and it's because the function is discontinuous there. We said it, it's a movable discontinuity. So for that whole chunk of x values though, from minus infinity to minus four, you're continuous. You're not continuous at minus four though, so you have to use parentheses there. Then we move to the next piece. The next interval we're gonna look at is from minus four to minus two. Nice function, nothing wrong there. You're continuous at all those points in that interval. But you're actually continuous from the left at negative two, so we can use a square bracket there. There's actually, from that, from that on that part, you're coming at it from the left-hand side and you're continuous from the left. You're headed to where the function is at. So you put a square bracket. All right, the next chunk of x values. You would think the next interval should be minus two to zero, but no, zero is just a sharp point of the graph. It's not a point where you're discontinuous at. Go all the way from minus two to two. That entire interval there, your function is continuous. Next interval, two to four. You're continuous there. At four, you're gonna dive down to minus infinity. And then at two, you're gonna be headed towards, at least on the right-hand side, where the function is at. If you're headed to where the function is at, you can use a square bracket. So two to four, with a square bracket on two. Not on four, though. And then you would think, well, four to six. Why is it six here? But no, it's a four to infinity for the last interval. And um, square bracket on four, because you're headed to where the function is at. Now, officially, if we ask for this, and we want the entire answer of where the function is continuous at, instead of stating the intervals, um, what, what we have to do is put union symbols in between all of these different um, non-overlapping intervals. Okay, all right, great. You can use this square bracket if where you're headed to is where the function is at. Continuous from the left there, continuous from the right on these two guys, both the two and the four. All right, great. So somebody gives you a function and you take another function and you wanna combine those functions together and discuss continuity. Okay, so say so you have a function f and a function g. And let's talk about the, at the point. Go back to talking about continuity at a point. If the function f is continuous at the point and the function g is continuous at the point, any kind of way of combining them, you'll be able to keep that continuity at that point. If you add the two functions, they'll be continuous at that point. Subtracting shouldn't change. As long as they are both continuous at that point, then multiplying them should work too. Dividing them should work as long as you're not dividing by zero. 
multiplying one of them by a, a constant, you should be able to say that's continuous still. So combining continuous function gives you a continuous function. Great. The hardest part, though, is when you have a composite function. That's the hardest combination of two functions. So if your inside function is continuous at x equals a, and where it's headed to, its limit value is a place where your outside function is continuous at, then yeah, f of g of x will be continuous at x equals a. Remember, you start on the inside, you focus there. g of a, that's, that's some value. And if that's a place where your function f is continuous at, then yeah, the entire composite function is continuous at that particular x value. Okay, so long as g of x is continuous at a and f is continuous at that place where g is headed. All right, so why do we say this? Well, well now we want to be able to look at just functions and be able to say, oh, well, this function is just continuous wherever it is defined at. Somebody, asks, somebody gives you a function and asks, where is this function continuous at? You try to find where it's defined at. You try to find its domain because we can com the way we can combine continuous functions together like this, we can then answer the question that a function is going to be continuous wherever it is defined at. Continuous at every number in their domain. All categories, right? Polynomial functions, well, they're continuous everywhere. But rational functions, root functions, trig functions, all these guys, ex exponential log, inverse trig, all of our categories, even the hyperbolic trig. I left that one out. But uh, yeah, all these functions are continuous everywhere they are defined. So someone gives you a function and asks you, where is this function continuous at? It's a question that you've done before. In disguise, it is a domain question. Where's this function defined at? What kind of things would be bad? Division by zero in this question. We'll factor that x plus 3, x plus 2 is how it factors. And so then we, we are not continuous if x is ever allowed to be equal to negative 2. We are not continuous if x is ever allowed to be negative 3. All numbers accept those. Now, how do you report that answer in interval notation? Well, um, think of a number line, right? and uh, chop the number line up. Uh, I guess green, yeah, let's go green. Okay, so take off negative three and put an X there. Take off negative two and put an X there. Every place else you're defined at, except for those two guys. So then when it's time to write the interval notation version, you go from minus infinity up to negative three. You go from three, I'm sorry, negative three, to negative two, and then you go from negative two to infinity. Uh, parentheses everywhere, and union symbols in between. Okay, all right, great. How about number two, uh, the second function here, g. Four x squared minus nine, underneath a radical. You know you can't take the square root of a negative number. So where would that polynomial underneath there ever be negative at? The nice thing about that polynomial, it's a parabola. Parabola that open upward. The coefficient on x squared is a positive. So looking at this parabola then, in between the roots, if there are roots, in between the roots, it's going to dip and be negative. What kind of roots does this guy have? Well, um, if x squared is equal to 9 fourths, then x would be equal to 3 halves and negative 3 halves. Anything that's in between 3 halves and negative 3 halves that parabola dips below, the graph of it dips below the x-axis, making it negative. We can't have that. Okay. And so, we have to avoid that. Draw the number line. X out that whole, let me draw it. Draw the number line and basically X out that whole part. So we go from negative 3 halves to negative, uh, to 3 halves. And we have to take out all these guys. Throw them out. They can't be allowed. X is zero. That's a problem. <laughs> all right. But everything else is fine. And it's okay to have the square root of zero. So you can have square brackets here. That's fine. 
And you go from minus infinity up to negative three halves and you go from, this should be positive, sorry. You go from three halves um, up, to, up to infinity with square brackets on these guys. Okay, great. How about tan of 2x? How about tan of x? Tan of x is minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And then again and again, it happens in this sort of period of pi. What is a 2 multiplied on x due to the period of your graph? So um, a 2 multiplied on y would be a stretch, but a 2 multiplied on x is a compression. When your period used to be pi, now your period is pi over 2. So this particular function has a period of, um, it goes from minus pi over 4 to pi over 4. It has a period of pi over 2. It's been compressed in. And so um, you have to avoid, uh, with, with, with tangent, your, your domain is uh, basically pi over 2 and minus pi over 2 have to be thrown out. 3 pi over 2 and minus 3 pi over 2 have to be thrown out. And so on. Any odd multiple of pi over 2 has to be thrown out. So the way you can say that would be um, pi over 2 plus n pi. So pi over 2 plus pi would take you to 3 pi over 2. And taking away pi would be negative 3 pi over 2. So n could be any integer. n, n is 1, 3 pi over 2 is gone. n is 2, 5 pi over 2 is gone. n is negative 1, negative 3 pi over 2 is gone. N is negative 2. Negative 5 pi over 2 is gone. All those guys are gone. All real numbers except those guys. That's for tan. What about tan of 2x? Same thing, but it's pi over 4. And then your period is pi over 2. Any multiple of pi over 2, any integer multiple of pi over 2 has to be thrown out. Uh, there's no real nice way to write that as far as like interval notation. <laughs> um, if you asked for like, you know, a certain number of intervals we could do it but um there's infinitely many of these intervals so a good way to describe it is all real numbers except pi over four and negative pi over four and any integer multiple of pi over two okay all right great let's go ahead and end this video it's gotten too long already um, in the next video, we'll look at an example of uh, using some algebra to solve, uh, to find out um, if a function is supposed to be continuous everywhere and you have a piecewise function, what kind of values can you have to make sure that the, the parts will meet up? It's a standard question. And then we'll look at uh, the, inter, uh, the intermediate value theorem, which is a consequence of being continuous. My name is Nakai Remmer. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Like and subscribe. Comment down below. Take care.